Silence fills the streets of Baldur's Gate as a lone man issues a challenge to Lord Evenmire. A dark star hangs over your head, Lord. Today is the day you pay for your treachery, he says. The Lord turns facing the boy, staring down at him. Foolish boy, I own this town. You have it a weapon upon you. How dare you think you could stand up to me? As the Lord Ebenmeyer's guards close in around the man, he reaches forth and a blade of shimmering dark magic appears in his hands. Gripping the weapon, he cries out in an eldritch voice, Lord Ebenmeyer, today you die. I curse you under the sign of ill omen. Greetings! My name is Monty Martin. And I'm Kelly McLaughlin. And, and we, we are, are the Dungeon, Dungeon Dudes. Dudes. Welcome to our channel where we cover everything Dungeons and Dragons, including advice for players and guides for Dungeon Masters. We upload new videos every Thursday, so please subscribe to our channel so that you never miss an episode. Today we are covering the Hexblade Warlock in Dungeons and Dragons 5th Edition. This was a new subclass introduced in Xanathar's Guide to Everything. So you will need a copy of this book in order to follow along with the build guides and role-playing advice we're discussing today. We're going to be taking a look at the Hexblade Warlocks, class features, abilities, what feats you might want to take, as well as spells, Eldritch Invocations, all to help you role-play the best Hexblade Warlock you can. There is a lot to discuss, so let's get rolling. Warlocks in general are a very unique and interesting to role-play class because of their ties to a pact and a patron. And the Hexblade is one of the most interesting patrons that you can choose. Unlike other warlocks who forge packs with fiends, fey, and creatures of the far realm and beyond, a Hexblade warlock forms their relationship with an arcane weapon of some kind. This might be an intelligent artifact, like the famous sword Black Razor, or the Sword of Cass. And in many cases, the Hexblade Warlocks are connected to the energies of the Shadowfell, where these dark weapons come from. And through that, they may be connected as well to other eldritch and semi-divine entities like the Raven Queen and perhaps even Vecna. A Hexblade Warlock might form their pact with an intelligent magic item. They could even make one up or choose one from the various books, but really any magic item could be their pact. The worlds of Dungeons and Dragons are packed with nefarious, intelligent, sinister, and cursed magical items and artifacts. And this is a great entry point into the Hexblade Warlock. Perhaps your character became a Hexblade Warlock because they were living a perfectly normal life. And then they found this enchanted blade, or a strange puzzle box, or even happened upon a curious ring at the bottom of a river. I love the symbiotic relationship that occurs here. And I think of so many other famous examples of entities that take different forms. I even, being a huge Marvel fan, look at things like Venom and the relationship between those two. Venom isn't exactly a weapon, but that transition that goes from yeah. this is Venom, this is Eddie Brock, to we are Venom. And eventually they get to kind of work together to control the powers that they now both have, and they form that sort of bond. More so than just being a symbiotic relationship with your warlock patron, as in Venom, in the Hexblade Warlock, we have the symbiotic relationship between sword and spell, which is a really, really satisfying and fun playstyle to be that character that can go in sword swinging and then also spell slinging. It's something that so many people have been asking for in Dungeons and Dragons 5th edition for a while. And there have been a few examples that kind of touch on this, but honestly, none of them are quite as precise as the Hexblade Warlock. You are a primary spellcaster, but the Hexblade gives you options that allow you to pick up a sword or other weapon or in some cases, even a bow or ranged weapon and build your character around combat in that sense, rather than just focusing on spellcasting. The awesome role-playing potential and the really unique playstyle, I think are the hallmarks of why you would wanna play a Hexblade Warlock. I think another really big attraction to the subclass is the fact that it is a charisma-based caster class, which makes role-playing a great 
option for you. You really get to engage in the social dynamic of that character. And so playing a Hexblade Warlock really makes you feel like you get to have it all. Because you get to fight in melee combat, you get to wield spells, you get to be that social force in the party as well. You really get a little bit of everything, but the class does still have some weaknesses behind it. For anybody who's played a Warlock out there, one of the biggest hardships of playing a Warlock is the spell slots that you get. Warlocks use the Pact Magic spellcasting method, which differs from the methods of spellcasting used by other spellcasters. They regain their spell slots back on a short rest, which can be a pretty big advantage. The trade-off from this is a limited number of spells known, and the fact that for most of that Warlock's career, they only have two spell slots, only gaining a third spell slot at 11th level and a fourth spell slot at 17th level. With these limited spell slots and the limited amount of spells known, if you add onto that the Hexblade Warlock's spell list that they get, it's not as good as some of the other options for Warlocks out there. The expanded spell list is good, but by no means amazing, and many of the Hexblade Warlock's key clash features are very front-loaded. By taking only two or three levels of Warlock, you get a lot of what the Hexblade has to offer. And so there's often a very big temptation to take those couple levels of Warlock and then multi-class to Paladin or Sorcerer or Bard, which are some very, very potent multi-class combinations, as long as you can figure out the role-playing angle that actually explains that. One last pitfall of the Hexblade Warlock is the amount of competition that they have over their bonus action and what to do with it on their turn. And the final point is that the Warlock is a surprisingly complex class and it requires a fair amount of planning in choosing your feats, spells, Eldritch invocations, and more. Which is why we don't generally recommend the Warlock to new players because the character building elements of it are so much more complex. All in all, the Hexblade Warlock is still a surprisingly versatile and fun character to play at the table. But what are some of the key class features and abilities that we're going to want to be aware of if we're choosing this subclass? So when we flip open to the Hexblade Warlock features, like all Warlocks, you have to choose to be a Hexblade right away at first level. So unlike the other classes that get to pick their subclass at level 3, Warlocks have to commit right, right away. But you immediately gain some benefits. The first one is the expanded spell list, which includes some new spells that you can choose to learn, including spells like Shield, Blur, Blink, and Banishing Smite, which is actually really good. But you also gain the Hex Warrior trait, which has a few really key properties. At first level, you acquire the training necessary to effectively arm yourself for battle. You gain proficiency with medium armor, shields, and martial weapons. The influence of your patron also allows you to mystically channel your will through a particular weapon. When you finish a long rest, you can touch one weapon that you are proficient with that lacks the two-handed property. When you attack with that weapon, you can use your charisma modifier instead of strength or dexterity for the attack and damage rolls. The really cool perk, though, is that if you later choose the Pact of the Blade, this class feature then applies to any Pact weapon you conjure using the Pact of the Blade. So you could have a bow, a halberd, a greatsword, or any two-handed or ranged weapon as your Pact weapon, and then make your attack and damage rolls with it using your Charisma score. Also at first level, you gain the special ability Hexblade's Curse. Starting at first level, you gain the ability to place a Baleful Curse on someone. As a bonus action, you choose one creature you can see within 30 feet of you. The target is cursed for one minute. The curse ends early if the target dies, you die, or you are incapacitated. Until the curse ends, you gain the following benefits. You gain a bonus to the damage rolls against the cursed target equal to your proficiency bonus. Any attack roll you make against the cursed target is a critical hit on a roll of 19 or 20 on the d20. If the cursed target dies, you regain hit points equal to your warlock level plus your charisma modifier. After you use this feature, you cannot use it again until you finish a short or long rest. As our Hexblade Warlock gains levels, we will gain a few additional features, such as the Accursed Spectre class feature at level 6, which allows us to draw out the soul of a slain foe and turn them into the uh, Spectre that serves us in the middle of a fight. The Spectres aren't very powerful at higher levels, but it's still a nice little meat shield to dish out a little bit of extra damage and just get in the way of your enemies, and it's a pretty cool ability. The Armor of Hexes, which we gain at level 10, will allow us to negate attacks our cursed target makes against us by rolling a d6, and if you get a 4 or higher, 
the attack has no effect against you. At 14th level, we gain Master of Hexes, which allows you to take your Hexblade's curse and move it to a different target as a bonus action when the target dies. All in all, some pretty awesome class features. I think all of these are excellent. I actually just think it's unfortunate how much people multi-class with the Warlock because the high level abilities are actually really good. And that's really the interesting thing here is you're taking a spellcaster class, giving them armor proficiency, shields, master of weapons, hexes to improve their combat prowess, and the ability to negate hits coming at them. It makes for a really interesting playstyle. So all that in mind, let's figure out how we're going to build our Hexblade Warlock. Let's start with the ability scores. This one should be obvious considering that your weapon attacks now get to benefit from your charisma modifier. Charisma has to be your go-to ability score. Absolutely. If you've rolled your ability scores, I think unequivocally you want to put your highest roll in your charisma score. And if you are going with point by, crank that thing right up to 15. With charisma being the fuel for your spell casting, your damage, and your social aspects of the game, it's got to be your highest stat. Because you are a spellcaster, I would say the constitution would be the second. Yes, with dexterity being the third. The Hexblade Warlock is proficient with shields and medium armor, which means that you don't benefit from a dexterity modifier of higher than plus two when it comes to calculating your AC. It does still give you a benefit for your initiative and other ability checks, but as a Hexblade Warlock, you probably want to be going for that breastplate or suit of half-plate armor, and you may be even considering using a shield, so you're going to have an excellent armor class even without a good dexterity score, so I think I would be cranking up my constitution as the number two point as well. You're going to want to use your spell slots on concentration spells, but you're often going to be on the front lines, which means you're going to be taking more hits. So you're going to be making a lot of concentration checks. Not to mention it's going to beef up your hit points, so being on the front lines is less of an issue if you have a good constitution. Beyond that, the other ability scores for your character are really up to how you want to roleplay them. Um, I'm very partial to the idea of Warlocks often having a low wisdom score. I think you kind of got to be a little unhinged to make an Eldritch Pact. You might be intelligent enough to seek out this power, yeah. but not wise enough to know that it's a terrible idea. So with all that in mind, what do we think the top races are for playing a Hexblade Warlock? My top picks for Hexblade Warlocks are going to be Variant Humans, Half-Elves, and Tieflings. I think all three are iconic, awesome, and incredibly potent. I completely agree with you, and I actually have the same top three picks, but in the interest of being different, I'm going to go with Halflings, uh, which could be a really, really fun roleplay, Tabaxi, or Azamar, or Azamar. And six one one half does the other. I think that that's a great pairing, especially opposite the Tiefling. All of these races have a bonus to their charisma score, which is the main thing that we're looking for because the Hexblade Warlock relies on that so heavily. But they also have great secondary benefits, whether in the case of the variant human gaining a feat, which is really important for the Hexblade Warlock because you really want a lot of feats for them. For the half-elves, just the two extra ability score boosts, the bonus skills, dark vision, all amazing. And with tieflings, they're iconic. You've got dark vision, fire resistance, and a few other really cool perks as well. Halflings get lucky. Yep. And that's always just a fun skill to have. Now we have a really big list of decisions to make because as we level up our Hexblade Warlock, we're going to have to choose feats and ability score increases, Eldritch Invocations, and our spells. And this is a lot of choices and they all overlap with one each other. So what we've done is Kelly and I have both built our own Hexblade Warlock. I've taken mine up to 13th level. I think you took yours up to 9th level. Yeah. And we've picked a couple invocations, a couple feats, and a couple spells for each. This is by no means the only way to build a Hexblade Warlock. This is just the way that we've done it together. And I think we started though with the same base because I think we both took the same feats. I think we almost built the same character and then <laughs> I decided to diverge a little yeah. and try to mix things up a bit. So I went with a variant human for my Hexblade Warlock and I took Polar Master right off the bat. <laughs> I did a tiefling and I also took Polar Master because it's just such a good combination. As I leveled up my Hexblade Warlock, I picked up Great Weapon Master right away. And then I continued on to max out my Charisma score. And 
then when I want to, I'm going to take Warcaster at some point in there. But it's actually really hard to decide how and when to take all those feats and when to boost your charisma up to the max. So there's a couple different approaches, but those were my main three. Warcaster, Polar Master, and Great Weapon Master, and then boosting up my charisma score as high as I could get it. I played a Tiefling, so I didn't get that feat right away. Yeah. So I did miss out on that, but... My character was very much about using a glaive in combat as their hexblade weapon. The only other feat that's really important to mention here, if you're playing a half-elf or an elf or a ladrin or a drow, which actually all make really good hexblades too, would be elven accuracy. Because hexblades have some nice tricky ways of getting advantage on their attack rolls, and then you can really make elven accuracy work for you in that case. If you do decide to go with a ranged combat version of the Hexblade Warlock, Sharpshooter is an excellent feat to look at, and it works really well with the Elven Accuracy. The one thing to be careful of is a lot of people like to pair Sharpshooter with Crossbow Expert, but the Hand Crossbow is excluded from the list of options for the Hexblade Warlock's Packed Weapon. Even when you take the Improved Packed Weapon Invocation, the Hand Crossbow is still not an available option. This is probably something that I would house rule as a DM and allow. I don't think it's a huge problem, but it's worth noting if you're trying to play an Adventurer's League character or if you've got a very strict Dungeon Master that that's actually not a choice. So now let's talk about the spells that each of us picked for our Hexblade. And I think we went very different routes here. Uh, what were the three cantrips that you went with? Uh, I went with Eldritch Blast, Mage Hand, and Minor Illusion. Those are all excellent choices. I went a little bit of a different route, and I went with Lightning Lure, Press of Digitation, and Minor Illusion. The Hexblade Warlock is an excellent candidate for the new spells that were introduced in the Sword Coast Adventures look guide, like Green Flame Blade and Booming Blade as well. Just be aware that with some of these, it's difficult to use them with reach weapons because they specify a range of five feet. So if you are planning on going with a pole arm with something like Booming Blade, recognize that Booming Blade actually has a range of five feet, so you can't use it with a reach weapon's reach attacks. For myself, the choice of Lightning Lure was the option to pull enemies closer to yeah. me with, if we have Pole Arm Master, I can then pull them within 10 feet of me and then they're within my range. So that was a really fun choice. I also wanted to avoid Eldritch Blast, even though it's obviously one of the best choices you can have. But if I'm building a character who's designed to get into combat, I wanted to avoid falling back too much on my awesome ranged cantrip. The reason why I want to have Eldritch Blast as a Hexblade is because there's lots of flying enemies or there's lots of times when you might not be able to get up to the enemy that you want to strike and being able to toss out a couple quick Eldritch Blasts, get some damage in there, can be really, really useful in a clutch situation. For my Hexblade Warlock, I chose a mixture of utility and damage dealing spells. I chose Hex, Shield, Invisibility, Darkness, Hypnotic Pattern, Counterspell, Thunderstep, Scrying, and Synaptic Static. I also am going to take the Eldritch Invocations for Sculptor of Flesh and Sign of Ill Omen so I can cast Polymorph and Bestow Curse. So for my spells, I picked Blink, Branding Smite, Counterspell, Dimension Door, Hex, Hunger of Hadar, Major Image, Shadow of Moil, and Summon Greater Demon. And because I'm a Tiefling, I also get Darkness and Hellish Rebuke. I just find that as a warlock, you really want those multifunctional spells. They're really good concentration spells that are going to give you the most bang for your buck for your limited spell slots, or the spells that kind of operate as Swiss army knives. So now that we've looked at our feats and spells, we want to pair these really nicely with our Eldritch Invocation choices. And there's a lot of awesome invocations to choose from. Yeah, I think there's over 40 now when you include the ones that were added in Xanathar's Guide to Everything. And while there are a couple level requirements for each, generally speaking, you've got a bunch of invocations that can augment Eldritch Blast, a few that augment the Hexblade playstyle, and then a bunch more that give you lots of quirky abilities or grant you expansions to your spell list. So for myself, I chose the following Eldritch Invocations. Devil Sight, so that I can see normally in darkness, both magical and non-magical. I chose Improved Packed Weapon, so that I can use my Packed Weapon as a spellcasting focus, but also augment it with a plus one bonus to attack and damage rolls. Next, I chose Thirsting Blade, which I think is a must-have for all Hexblade Warlocks with the Pact of the Blade, as this one will allow you to attack twice with the 
attack action on your turn. I also then chose the Sculptor of Flesh invocation to let me cast the Polymorph spell, and the Sign of Ill Omen invocation so that I could cast Bestow Curse. Finally, once my Warlock reaches 11th level, I'm going to take the Life Drinker invocation so that when I hit a creature with my Pact Weapon, they take extra necrotic damage equal to my Charisma modifier. So I also took Improved Pack Weapon and Thirsting Blade. I would consider those and Life Drinkers absolute must-haves for the Hexblade Warlock. They're such good choices, and I think any Hexblade Warlock would benefit from them. The rest of my choices, though, were a little bit different than yours. I also took Eldritch Smite, which allows you to expend a spell slot to do an additional 1d8 force damage when you hit, plus another additional 1d8 per level of the spell slot. I took Maddening Hex, which allows you as a bonus action to deal your Charisma modifier in Psychic Damage to the target cursed by your Hex spell or another Cursing Warlock feature. And I took Relentless Hex, which allows me as a bonus action to teleport up to 30 feet to an unoccupied space within 5 feet of a target cursed by my Hex or another Cursing Warlock feature. So I really designed my character about being able to move around the battlefield. I love this idea of a warlock who can just disappear and reappear next to his enemy. Mine is built a lot around the hex spell and manipulating that. My character is much more aggressive in their, in their play style. My character is based on casting the darkness spell on themselves, taking advantage of devil's sight and wading into melee combatant and making a bunch of attacks with advantage. And lastly, I picked that relentless hex because I love the idea of playing this nightcrawler type character who's just teleporting around the battlefield. And the Hex spell allows me to then teleport within range. I also have Dimension Door to continue to teleport. I have ways of getting my enemies where I want them to be and get me where I need to be on the battlefield. Another final nice capstone that I took for my Hexblade was Banishing Smite, which is an amazing spell that you can use to take an enemy out of the battle, as well as deal a boatload of damage to them. This is normally a spell that is exclusive to very high-level Paladins, so being able to pick it up as a Hexblade is a nice little perk. Now, Warlocks are technically full casters. You do gain 6th, 7th, 8th, and 9th level spells through the Mystic Arcanum class feature, but it is a little bit more restricted than other high level spell casters. In my case, as I leveled my Warlock up to the very, very high levels, I decided to go with Mental Prison for my 6th level Mystic Arcanum. One of my favorite spells. Yeah. A really awesome way to take an enemy out of the fight. I went with Force Cage for my 7th level. I, I really think there's no other choice here. You might be able to make an argument for Plane Shift, but I think it's got to be Force Cage. For my 8th level Mystic Arcanum, I'm going to go with Feeble Mind, just because something about it speaks to me. I think that the 8th level is a hard pick, but Feeble Mind was my choice. What's your ninth level? Ninth level one, once again, I because Warlocks don't get Wish... I feel like the best choice here is True Polymorph, with uh, Foresight coming in as second place for the ninth level, Mystic Arcanum. I will also mention Psychic Scream as a choice here, but that's more for Warlock flavor. I think Psychic Scream really, once again, speaks to that Eldritch Horror aspect of a Warlock. And so I kind of like picking spells that speak to the role play. Mm. Uh, and I find that Psychic Scream could be a really fun choice. I think True Polymorph wins out for me for this sort of reason. You know how there's that phrase that says, always be yourself, unless you can be Batman, then be Batman? Well, in Dungeons and Dragons, always be yourself, unless you can be a dragon, and then you should be a dragon. So to wrap up, uh, I think the Hexblade Warlock is such a cool class to roleplay. I'm really in love with I this idea of the flawed character who picked up a cursed item that they shouldn't have, and who has this battle of wills, venom symbiosis style between the item, their own powers, and their own personality. I think it's such a cool concept to roleplay. I have to give props to a character that plays a Hexblade Warlock at my table. Uh, Dan plays a great version of this, which he actually came up with before we even started talking about this idea, where his character was a want-to-be bard, who is a timid, shy, traveling musician, who took shelter in a 
in a house one day that happened to have a cult worshipping a weapon in it. And then the cult was wiped out by Drow. And as he was fleeing, he grabbed the weapon. And now he alters between this shy, timid version of himself and when the weapon takes control of him. And he actually plays two different voices at the table. It reminds me of tropes that you find in anime like Yu-Gi-Oh! Where, again, the characters found a puzzle box. And this different personality comes out of them in battle. And no one really knows what's going on. Everyone's like, oh, they're just completely normal. And it's not until later on that you realize that, oh, this mystic object is a horrible thing from beyond the worlds of the dead and time and space. And that this is a other personality that is inhabiting your otherwise timid and soft-spoken friend. And it's such a fun thing to see. And it actually sparks uh, role play at our entire table because there's always a moment where he's going, I don't know if we should go in there, guys. We should murder them all. And you're just like, what just happened? Which yeah. one are you? And the players are having a lot of fun playing around with that. And he's having a lot of fun mm -hmm. role playing that. So that's such a fun aspect. But it also gets him into trouble, which he uses it as his flaw as well. Where if he's in a situation where he's trying to be polite and nice, and then the other personality comes out and is like aggressive and mean, suddenly it can cause problems yeah but he really likes to play into that once in a while and i think playing into your flaws there's so many good flaws to have with a warlock hexblade i also love the idea of a legacy weapon or some sort of famous D, &D artifact being your hexblades packed what if you had a character that found the eye or hand of vecna as a low-level character and instead of giving them the powers of that artifact the hand of Vecna is what's giving them their Hexblade powers. And then that is the arc for them, is that they found this horrible artifact. It's maimed their body, and they have to deal with that for the entirety of the character's life. And that sets up all their enemies and adversaries throughout the campaign. This also brings up another point that you don't necessarily have to have the weapon be yeah. the item. The weapon could be fueled by the powers that you gain. Yeah, so the hand of Vecna is conjuring this spectral blade that you're using. Or maybe even you just reflavor it and say that the hand itself counts as another weapon. Or it could be a ring that has the powers of, of, of a spectral weapon inside of it. It could be kind of Green Lantern-y there. Or I was even thinking Lord of the Rings and now your uh, patron is Sauron. Yes, yeah. So there, there's all sorts of great ways to evolve this. And I think that ultimately... That, to me, is my favorite part of the Warlock class. It just has so much flavor and role-playing ideas married into the mechanics in a way that few other classes in D&D really do. There's something about having a patron beyond yourself that classes like Warlocks and Clerics and Paladins give that character a purpose and a motivation and a mystery and personality traits that you can really play off. And that makes such a rewarding and memorable character. So this has been a look at the Hexblade Warlock in Dungeons & Dragons 5th Edition. If you've played an awesome Hexblade Warlock, tell us about them in the comments below. If you're enjoying our show, please consider supporting our work on Patreon. You can find out how you can contribute to the channel by following the links in the description below. Don't forget to check out our live play Dungeons of Drakenheim, which airs Tuesday nights at 6 p.m. Eastern on Twitch. You can find all the previous episodes right up over here. And of course, we've got plenty more guides to the classes and subclasses of Dungeons & Dragons 5th Edition right up over here. Please subscribe to our channel so that you never miss an episode. Thank you so much for watching, and we'll see you next time in, in the, the Dungeon. dungeon.